So uh, today uh, we'll finish off the optimization part and uh, move into the first of the logic. Okay, so what is the optimization? Um, so I want to find the maximal click. So remember, click is the complete subgraph. We want to uh, find the maximal size of click. And, uh, or also the short number. You want to find the uh, uh, maximal interval uh, such that uh, the sets can be uh, sum free. Um, and there's also coloring. You want to color the graph, but using minimal number of colors, okay? And uh, if you have Hamiltonian cycle, uh, we want to actually add cost to the edges so that you can actually optimize the cost of the travel. So optimization is actually, uh, in many, many uh, places, uh, we have to solve optimization problem. So, so far, uh, when you talk about whether this is a model that satisfies the constraint, this is a satisfaction problem. But uh, in addition to this satisfaction, we want to do optimization. We are not just interested in uh, the solutions uh, that doesn't optimize anything. It's just uh, we want to actually maximize or minimize uh, some uh, uh, cost or some utility. Okay, so there's a huge area in computer science. Um, and if you go to, uh, for instance, neural network, it tries to optimize the uh, errors uh, in the uh, data uh, versus the prediction. Uh, if you want to go into the uh, robot planning, uh, you want to optimize the, uh, uh, some actions that uh, uh, achieve the goal. Uh, so a lot of problems can be actually cast in the optimization. And there are also a lot of uh, ways to solve optimization problem. Probably the most well-known is so-called dynamic programming. Uh, you basically are uh, iterati uh, iteratively uh, solving these problems, okay? So uh, what happens in the Klingo is similar, um, but we are not going to talk about uh, uh, dynamic programming here, but uh, we want to say how we can instruct Klingo to uh, find optimal solutions. And we'll just focus on only two uh, constructs here, which is uh, maximize and minimize statement, okay? So uh, what uh, this is doing, uh, uh, the, uh, these uh, statements are to optimize the sum of the ways. So, when we do uh, maximize, we are going to write uh, the syntax uh, like this, okay? So uh, if you look at uh, this inside, this is actually similar to the uh, aggregate uh, expression. And in fact, you can think about this list kind of aggregate, although it doesn't actually sum out the weight, uh, but you want to find the optimal uh, weight, okay? So what you put here is you put uh, some variable or sometimes tuples of variables on the left-hand side of column, and this is the condition. What are the instances of the variable that you want to uh, count in? So basically, if you see this one, you'll try to maximize the x such that p of x is true. And the way that it, uh, uh, the Klingo understand it is, think about this is as just a sum of x uh, p of x. So this will return the sum uh, of this x that belongs to p. And when you, uh, when you write a maximize statement, what it means is to find the maximal, uh, uh, find the stable model that gives the maximal sum. Okay, so that's what we uh, are going to use. And I will give you the example in a moment, uh, but just to give you some flavor, you want to say, I want to find the stable model. There are multiple stable models possible, but among them, I want to find uh, the uh, sum of this x is maximized. Okay, so that's what uh, we want to do. The next one is also minimize is actually dual, so I don't have to explain this again, okay? So let's actually consider a simple uh, uh, combinatorial problem called a uh, knapsack problem. And this problem is uh, basically a knapsack here, and you have items to put. And how, there is actually the uh, capacity. You can only put up to uh, 15 kilogram. And there are uh, these uh, uh, objects that you can put. And each of the uh, objects has two uh, values. One is actually the weight. Another is uh, kind of the um, utility, okay? So uh, val uh, value, 
of the item. So the idea is you want to put uh, the uh, uh, values here under this 15 kilogram, but you want to maximize these uh, values, right? And as you can imagine, this is not really only about the knapsack. Any kind of computational problem, uh, many kind of uh, computational problem is to optimize uh, this kind of setting. Okay, you have only uh, limited capacity, and you can put some resources, okay, and you have to uh, maximize uh, uh, the uh, the value. So you can think about like a CPU that has to carry over multiple jobs. Each job has certain values when you accomplish. So, but you cannot actually do that uh, at the same time. Then, what is actually the best uh, way to uh, put it? Okay. Now, there are actually multiple versions of this problem, and we will consider a very simple one for now. Um, some variations include, uh, you don't have actually only one item here. You can have multiple items of the same uh, weight and same uh, value, okay? But for now, let's just say that there's only uh, these uh, uh, five objects here. So is it obvious what is actually the uh, good uh, solution to this problem? So obviously, we cannot put everything here because it's 12, 1, 4, 1, 2. If you add up, it, um, uh, over, uh, it is over this uh, 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 capacity, right? 15 kilograms. So it looks like, well, I have um, so $10 with only 4 uh, kilograms, so it might be good to add this here. OK, um, what about then uh, this one? This is actually the next uh, larger value. This is 14, OK? Uh, unfortunately, it's actually 16 kilograms, so it is actually overcome. So maybe this is not good, so then I can do like this one, and maybe what's the next one? Maybe I can use this one, right? And so on and so forth, okay? The problem here is actually simple. There are not many objects, so you can try all possible uh, combinations, and you can find the answer. What is actually the answer? What is the answer? Well, if you don't know, well, let's see how Klingo answers this question. Um, so we are going to uh, tell the Klingo about the problem instance. So here uh, we, ha uh, we want to say uh, this is A, B, C, D, E, OK? So A raise uh, 12 kilogram, B raise uh, 1 kilogram, C 4, D, uh, actually. D is here, D is two, and E is one, okay? And the value is A is four, B is two, C is 10, D is two, two dollars, and E is one dollar, okay? So this is how we tell the system what uh, objects that we have. And this is max weight is uh, 15. So this is problem instance, okay? It's kind of database fact. How do we then uh, tell the Klingo to find the solution. So we have to write rules. And let's do this uh, together, okay? So in is a subset of the set of items. Again, we, are, we have subset relation, right? Okay, how do we uh, uh, write this rule, okay? Um, I intentionally use in predicate because many of the problems that we did uh, for the subset, I used the in as the name of that subset, okay? So this is the uh, rule that I write. So here, remember, uh, weight i comma w. I is the name of the objects, like a, b, c, d, e, and w was that uh, the weight of that object, right? So, so this give me this list of weight give me what are the items that I have, and among these items, I can actually choose to have this in, uh, i in the subset or not. This is the choice rule. Okay. So I had five objects, A, B, C, D, E, and I choose some of them. How many stable models will be generated at this point? For the particular example that we just saw in the previous slide. Uh, Brandon? 32. Okay, why 32? Because there were five objects and we are choosing the subset of five set. Okay, so 32, two times, two times, two times, two times, two, that's uh, 32. So there are 32 stable models. Okay. 
Um, so the next one is the total weight of the item uh, should not exceed uh, max weight. Okay, so we have to write a rule that expresses this, meaning that we have to sum up all the weight in the set, in this uh, set in, okay, and that weight, the sum of the weight should not exceed the uh, max uh, weight. And this is actually not too difficult if you just use aggregate. So this rule is saying that you sum up all the uh, weight, okay? So this in i means that we selected some uh, uh, item, okay? So this will give me all the items and weight, okay? And among them, we are going to add up all this weight. So note here that when you have tuples of variables, we are going to sum up uh, the first element. Okay, so let me read it again. So we are going to sum up all the weight such that i is in the uh, subset that we selected and i's weight is w. So we are going to uh, sum up all such weight. Okay, and this sum should not be uh, exceeding the max weight. If it exceeds max weight, and this violates the constraint. Okay, so this one means sum of the weights in the uh, subset that we selected here, and that should not exceed max weight. Okay. So so far, uh, we. Uh, said that uh, we are going to select subset and we just set uh, maximal uh, weight, but we didn't actually optimize it, meaning that uh, if we can, if we find the so, uh, stable models of this, well obviously uh, one of the stable models is empty set, right? Because you don't need to select anything, and if you don't do that, that the, max, uh, the weight uh, that you accumulate is zero, and zero is not greater than max weight, so you're fine. But this is not the solution that we want. We want to maximize the uh, items that are, that are in the set, right? That are in the subset that we selected. We want to put uh, 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 the uh, items as uh, much as possible, or actually the items, so that uh, this sum can be maximized, right? So what do we do? This is the last line. We have to optimize this selection. So far, we cannot distinguish between the stable models. But this time, we want to select only the best stable model using this maximize. Okay? So what do we maximize? We are going to uh, maximize the sum of the, all the values in the subset. Okay? Remember, this is to give all the, can, uh, all the things that we want to sum up. So, uh, this in predicate has all the items that we selected, and this v uh, is the uh, item's uh, value. And if you write this way, we are going to sum up all the uh, values and choose this uh, stable model that, maxim uh, that gives the maximal sum of the values. Okay? And if you look at uh, the NAFSEC problem, this is exactly uh, what the problem is stating in English, you have to find the subset such that it does not, uh, 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 is, uh, the sum of the weight does not uh, uh, exceed the max weight, but you also want to maximize the values in that set. That's it. Okay? And uh, there is actually another uh, Directive, uh, I want to only see the in predicate and I can write the show uh, directive. So let's actually play with this code. Uh, before I show you, uh, you the running, any question about the program? Okay. Then, uh, let me just show you again. This is the uh, NAPSEC problem uh, encoding that I show you. Uh, and this is the instance, okay? So the way that you run is actually the same. Um, Klingo, and then uh, give the file names. OK, so it's too quick, so let's actually scroll up. Scroll up. What happens? So uh, Klingo uh, tries, to, uh, tries to find uh, the solution. And uh, it does this in an iterative way, OK? 
So first, it tries to find one stable model. And here, uh, I guess, uh, here the uh, stable model is actually empty, OK? But then, Klingo tries to find a better one than the current one, uh, current one that we uh, found. So uh, the next uh, iteration, Klingo tries to add in B, which still satisfies all the constraint. OK? And then tries to add now e, uh, uh, in of E. OK? But it probably didn't work well. So it, uh, it deleted in of E and then uh, used in of D. OK? But then it tries to find the next uh, better one, which is now containing B, D, E. OK? And at some point, Klingo tries to see that, oh, actually, if I only include C, that's actually better than this solution. So it tries to do this. But then it found, uh, it saw that maybe e, uh, in E is good to add, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it does this uh, iterative way. And at the point, uh, at the last moment, uh, it cannot find a better solution, and it stops there. So the last one is uh, B, C, D, E. Actually, uh, except for the A, uh, that he has the uh, highest uh, uh, weight, uh, choose all the other fours. That was the best solution. Okay? Uh, so one thing is, Klingo doesn't find the optimal solution in one uh, time. It actually does this computation uh, internally uh, 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 in an iterative way. Although you didn't actually say to return all solutions, uh, Klingo tries to uh, find the better one. Now this is not the same as uh, finding all stable models and then count from uh, the best one there. Klingo doesn't do that stupid way. It does a bit more uh, uh, um, intelligent way. It's like uh, you go up to the hill, okay? Then you try to go up and up and up until you find the uh, max uh, height, okay? Uh, so you don't have to actually uh, go around to all places to find the solutions, but it tries to find the better one and better one and better one until you find uh, 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 the best one, OK? So this kind of uh, setting is because the optimization problem is actually computationally very difficult, OK? So in the general case, it might end up that you have to really generate all stable models. And there is no way to get around this problem. And if you go to upper computer science classes, you will see that uh, there is a complexity class for the problems. Uh, and you see uh, the uh, class of uh, uh, optimization problem is really hard there. Okay? Um, but that's actually what you don't have to worry at this point, because uh, you are not really programming in the low level. You actually write a high level program. Just tell Klingo to optimize the solution. You don't need to care about this complexity class under the hood of uh, uh, Klingo. Okay, so all you need to do is just to uh, write uh, this one line code. Okay, so just this one, and then Klingo will do the best uh, for you. Okay, all right, any question? Okay, good. Um, so we'll do some exercises. Um, in fact, the um, click, okay, so let's revisit this click. Okay, so this is the same slide that you saw before. You try to find a click of the maximal size. Well, at the time, we didn't know how to optimize, so we uh, tried to uh, change its n, and uh, we did uh, manually uh, by giving this command line n value. Okay, so if n equals three, n equals four, until we cannot find a click. So we tried to do that. If you did homework, you will remember what, uh, uh, how you did this problem. Okay. So, but now we don't want to do that manually. I want to only uh, run Klingo one time and let Klingo to do this uh, iterative process. How can I do that? So this is a maximal click. Now there are two things that you have to change. The first one is actually how do you choose uh, uh, n, n vertices, okay? So uh, let's actually uh, go back to this one. What, so the difference here, is I give the value of n. I want to maximize, I, I want to give uh, at least, uh, the click has, uh, should have at least n vertices. And I have to give this value. But in the maximal click, I don't want to do that. So what I do is, I don't give the low bound. I just say, just choose subset. Okay, so I don't have n here. That's one difference. 
Okay, I don't need to tell the n because that's what Klingo has to find, so I don't have to specify n here. Uh, the other rule is same, but now the next uh, last one is maximize statement. And this is a bit uh, strange, but uh, it makes certain sense if you look at it. So we want to maximize the uh, sum of the ones such that n of x is true. What does that mean? So if you have, say, uh, in of x, uh, let's say um, a stable model that we have is in of, say, 1, in of 2, in of 3. So uh, this is the stable model uh, that we have. Okay. So there may be some other predicates, but in terms of in, we have only 1, 2, 3 included. Okay. So for this one, what is the sum uh, of the ones such that n of x is true? So remember, I want to first generate this set. Generate this one, OK? So then I will have n of 1, n of 2, n of 3. Okay, so this one is how many ins do we have? We have one, two, three. So this will generate in com uh, one comma one, okay, one comma two, one comma three, and then add up, which gives three. Three is the current uh, value of the stable model. What Klingo will do is try to find a better stable model that has uh, the value here to be bigger than 3. So which tries to find more uh, in predicate, or more in atoms. Okay? In other words, in a simple way, what it means is uh, try to find as many as in atoms possible. That's what this is doing. Okay? So internally, Klingo used the sum predicate, but it's basically counting. You want to count how many in predicates are there. And you want to maximize that count. That's what is going on here. OK? So let me repeat. Uh, when you give this uh, stable model, for instance, I want to find out what is the current value uh, that we are considering here. So if you want to do that, you just um, count this. OK? So this, in, this set for this uh, 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 stable model will be in 1, 1. 1 comma 2, 1 comma 3, okay? And uh, Klingo will try to add this first value. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. So that's the current value of the stable model. And when you skip uh, this maximize, it will try to repeat this process for the next stable model. So let's say the next stable model happened to be uh, in 1, 2, let's say 4, 5. Okay? So then uh, the computation is same as before in 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 4, 1, 5. But this time, when you add up all this in, that will be 4. Okay? So then Klingo will now take this as the current stable model and repeatedly find next stable model such that this calculation gives a better score. Okay? All right, so that's the idea of maximal click. Okay, so let's go now into the uh, Hamiltonian cycle. Again, you saw this before, so let me not uh, go over the program again. Uh, but what we want to do uh, here is um, in addition to this uh, edge uh, relation, uh, we want to also assign the cost of the edges. Okay? So here uh, you have 1 to 2, uh, the cost is 2. Okay? You can say the travel cost. Uh, 2 to 4 okay, is uh, 2, okay, and so on and so forth. So for each of the edges, okay, it's not only connected, but also we say the cost of the edges. Okay? So we want to find the 
uh, solutions that uh, give the minimal cost. Which one is actually a good one? Anyone sees the minimal cost plan? Well, at least actually let's try to simulate what Klingo will do. So Klingo will try to find any stable model first and then try to find a better one and better one. So can you find any stable model that uh, uh, makes the Hamiltonian cycle? We did this before, I believe. So let's try, let's start with one, okay? Um, where shall we go? Four. One, two, four, okay, uh, all right. And then, four, two, two, okay, and then, Five, six, six three, three, one. So uh, this is the Hamiltonian cycle. Um, now let's uh, check the cost. The cost is uh, all adding all the sum of the weights. So this is one plus two plus two plus one plus three plus uh, three, right? So that gives uh, four threes. So that should be twelve. Okay. So the cost is 12. Can anyone find a better plan? So this is a good solution that we found before. So this is one of the valid solutions. But now the, our task is to uh, minimize the uh, uh, sum of the cost, uh, sum of the edge cost. Okay. Let me change the color. Um, okay. Three, Three, two, four. Okay. Two, one. Two, one. Two, two, five. five, six. Three. Okay. So what is the sum here? So it's uh, two plus one plus two plus. 2 plus 1 plus 3. Am I right? So this is 4, 4, 3. Okay, A plus 3 is 11. Okay, so 11 is a more optimal uh, plan here. Can we beat this one? So this is not the test that are uh, easy for us, even though the pro, uh, the the uh, graph is not too complex, but as you can imagine, if uh, you have the real US map with all the cities, then uh, finding the minimal cost plan is really hard um, using uh, hand. But let's try to do that in uh, Klingo. What you need to do is to write only one code here. Okay, so this is the uh, statement that you are going to do. What is, uh, what is it saying? So we want to minimize the cost, okay, such that uh, x, y is the uh, uh, edge in the Hamiltonian cycle, and that edge has cost c. So you want to minimize the sum of this cost. That's exactly what is going on here. Okay, so if you're not sure about how to write, I and mean, think about this way, so you want to count what to be considered in summing up all the cost. So here, remember, this minimize and maximize is to sum over all the Cs that satisfy this uh, condition, okay? So the condition that we are giving is look at all the uh, edges there 
which has the cost C. Okay? You sum up all these costs and, ask to, uh, and, and Klingo will find the minimal cost. Okay? So all you need to do is to give what to count, what to sum up, okay? What is the condition and what is to be uh, summed up here, okay? So let's play with this example. So uh, this is the Hamiltonian cycle program that you saw. And this is the edge cost. I also need to um, give the graph. I think it was graph.lp. OK, I think that's all. So let's actually type this up. So Hamiltonian cycle prog uh, main program and uh, the graph and then edge cost. Oh, simple thing. Okay, so uh, okay, I actually uh, split uh, this rule into another program. So let me actually uh, do this again. So in the slide, I sh uh, uh, showed these two files into one file, but in the here I have two separate one. So the optim uh, the ma uh, minimize statement is in here. Okay. So if I type this um, Klingo uh, find the solution, and uh, it doesn't actually find all stable models and find the optimal one. It actually uh, do only three because for this path to go up to the hill, um, you see only uh, three iterations, okay? And uh, the optimization is, uh, says 11, which was actually the uh, cost that we just found, okay? Any question about this? Okay, so, so basically, we just, um, what we have is only uh, one uh, line. We say minimize and maximize. And then we turn this decision problem into an optimization problem, okay? So if you want to do this kind of thing in your own programming, what would you do? Um, you have to do this all by yourself, right? So um, suppose you have somehow the program to solve uh, the Hamiltonian cycle problem. But then your boss says, uh, why don't you optimize this cost? And of course you have to say that I need some time, I have to debug the code, and or I have to look into the code again and change the data structure and uh, write, uh, write the ad, uh, routines to add up those costs and so on and so forth. And you have to implement optimization algorithm using one of the dynamic programming method. Uh, you need a lot of time to do that. Uh, but if you are using Klingo, then this is just one line of the code and you're done. Okay, and as you see, uh, it's actually a well-engineered system. Um, so you don't actually lose much of the efficiency either. Okay. All right, um, so we're done with ASP. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of other materials in ASP, um, but um, hopefully this gives you some introduction to the uh, logic programming. So if you're interested in, somebody ask what are the more resources possible, and I put some resources uh, on the Piazza so you can take a look at it. Uh, if you want to be more serious in the programming, so I try to make everything in uh, self-contained here, but um, if you uh, dare to look at the resources that I get, uh, posted, you'll see that a lot of other things there that might confuse you. Um, so my advice is maybe if you want to be more serious uh, uh, beyond the scope of what we did in the class, uh, maybe Klingo manual is the best way to go. 
Okay, so there's some nice introduction and so on, but there are also other uh, features that uh, might uh, confuse you. Okay, but uh, I think uh, essentially I covered the basic uh, materials of um, Klingo or ASP. So if you want to uh, be good at programming, I think the best is actually do the programming by yourself. Okay, manual is just to introduce more features, but you may not need all these features. Okay. All right, now uh, first order, okay? So uh, this one now we are going back to the, um, uh, the uh, logic uh, uh, foundation. So we talk about uh, propositional logic, okay? And then uh, what Klingo or ASP was doing is to tweak the semantics of propositional logic uh, so that we can say instead of models, we call stable models, and then uh, we, do, uh, we do these uh, combinatory problems there, okay? But there's actually, in a sense, more richer language than ASP, and this is actually first of the logic, okay? So uh, let's come back to the propositional logic. In propositional logic, um, uh, remember this was to talk about declarative sentences, like strain late and John late, uh, those kind of things. And we have a rule, propositional uh, uh, formulas, uh, saying that if the train is late and there's no taxi at the station, then John is late for the meeting. So these are the uh, kind of formulas or rules that we uh, uh, use okay, to, com uh, to make more complex reasoning possible. And we learned uh, propositional connectives like negation, conjunction, disjunction, and conditional statement. And that they cover many of the English statements for the logical reasoning. However, one thing that they don't cover well is uh, quantification, or the relation, or the objects. So let's actually look at this uh, example. The example here is saying every student is younger than some instructor. If you want to write this full sentence in propositional logic, you will see that there is no end or negation if then here. Only choice to represent the whole sentence that you have is write a propositional symbol P. The sentence here can be true or false, right? Every student is younger than some instructor. It is true or false question. However, I, um, the, old thing, uh, the only thing that I can do to represent this in propositional logic is to write whole sentence into P, and we are losing a lot of information here. The information here is there is certain relation between the student group and the instructor group, okay? And there is something about uh, the uh, properties of being a student, being an instructor, and uh, younger than uh, somebody else. All this relation, uh, the information about the relations are missing when you turn this into one proposition symbol, okay? So we need a richer language to be able to talk about this sentence. When you say every student is younger than some instructor versus every student is uh, uh, younger than every instructor, okay? These two are, of course, different sentences, but they have surely share a lot of uh, structure. In proposition logic, all you can do is this is P and another is Q. But P and Q are not related at all. Okay. So um, here is a brief introduction to first order logic. And fortunately, the first order logic is also built uh, on human intuition. So um, it's actually not very difficult to understand the intuition. Okay? The formal semantics is, uh, takes a certain time, but uh, we'll try to understand this in an informal way for now. Okay? So we are going to use this pretty good. Actually, uh, you're lucky because we already covered Klingo language, which does some sort of the first order feature there. So we have the predicate followed by the terms. Okay? So we are actually using the same uh, format here. So when we call uh, S of ND, so let's say S denote uh, that uh, uh, ND, uh, S denotes uh, being a student, and ND is the objects, okay? So or the terms or argument of this predicate. So we write S of ND and then read it as ND is a student. Okay? So uh, this is so-called unary pre uh, predicate, which means that uh, it has only one argument. The unary predicate is like a set of objects. Okay? So ND 
belongs to the set of student. S represents the set of uh, uh, student, and when you say S of Andy is true, that means Andy is a member of the student. Okay? So I of Paul, so Paul is an instructor. I represent the set of instructors. Okay? So it's clear, right? Now Y here takes two arguments. So when you have two arguments, binary predicate, that is to compare between these two, or to relate uh, between these two. So here we understand this symbol to represent that uh, uh, the first argument is younger than the second argument. So when you say y and the comma pole, and the is younger than uh, pole. Okay? And sometimes we also use the variables as in the Klingle. So s of x means x is a student. Uh, x is an instructor, or well, yxy means x is younger than y. Okay? Now, using these uh, features, you are ready to write any first order formula. And not any, actually. You are going to actually uh, write this uh, uh, formula. Actually, there are two more things that we have to say, which is the quantification. So, the quantification is for all something, uh, for all uh, x, uh, or they exist uh, uh, x. Okay? So, these are the things. So having that in mind, let's try to uh, read uh, this uh, formula. Okay, this formula is in, for in, uh, uh, is in first order logic. So for all x, okay, if x is a student, then there exists y such that y is an instructor and x is younger than y. It's a bit uh, too formal uh, uh, statement, but it's basically capturing the same English meaning. Okay, and you will probably practice these things, uh, same as what we did in the Klingo. I will give you some English statement, and you try to represent this in first order logic formulas. That will be the subjects of next quiz. Okay, so let me just repeat. You, uh, we are actually giving this interpretation. We are saying that by S, I will say that S means is a student. I means as an instructor, and Y means is a younger than. Having that interpretation in mind, you can read this uh, formula in English or turn this English into the formula. Okay? And sometimes when these uh, uh, formulas become complex, it's a bit hard to uh, turn this into English. Okay? So um, that's, uh, sometimes that happens. Okay, so so predicate formula. We are going to uh, we we'll look at this uh, syntax of the uh, predicate formula maybe next uh, class or maybe this today if uh, time permits. Uh, but basically, there are um, two uh, ingredients where we are talking about. Uh, the terms and also uh, the formulas. So uh, you can also relate this in terms of the terms in the Klingo. Okay? The objects, uh, Andy or Paul, these are the objects. The ob every object is called a term. As well as every function that is applied to the objects are also called terms. I will give you some example in a moment, but for now you can understand that term is a syntactic object to denote some individual in the domain. Okay, so you can think about the domain to be a set of people in this classroom. Okay, and your name uh, is an object here. When I say somebody uh, uh, made Ju Young, then that denotes the object me. Okay, so everybody has a name here, right? The terms is to denote which individual that we are talking about. This is not about true or false. This is about which object that we are talking about. Now, the formulas are different. The formulas are talk, uh, we are talking about truth values of the formulas. Okay? So, say that there exists a student who is not paying attention to this class now. That's a statement. That's a formula. That's a true or false statement. 
Okay. All right. So um, we'll actually uh, come back to these uh, formal notions uh, later. So let me actually uh, skip this for now. Okay. So let's uh, practice these examples. So no books are, are gaseous. Uh, dictionaries are books. Therefore, no dictionaries is gaseous. Okay. So this is a simple uh, inference uh, problem. In order to represent this, we need a language. We need to uh, denote this in uh, the uh, first order logic uh, symbols. So here, let's say b of x denotes that x is a book. g of x means that x is gaseous. And d of x means uh, x is a dictionary. Okay. Now, the advantage here is you can take all the propositional connectives that you already know. You can use all of them, plus quantification. Okay? So, so let's actually uh, represent each of the uh, sentences. No books are gaseous. How can we represent? So we say that there exists uh, uh, no uh, uh, element that belongs to a uh, book and gaseous. Right? That's one step to uh, turn into the formal. Okay. So how do we write this? No books are gaseous. So here is one way to do. There exists, there does not exist any X that belongs to the book as well as that belongs to the gaseous objects. So when you say no books are gaseous, you can write uh, in this way. Okay? Sometimes uh, there may be multiple, actually often, there may be multiple different ways to write the same formula. Okay? So if you write your formula and it turns out not to be exactly the same, that's also okay. Sometimes they are uh, different formulas, but their meanings could be the same. Okay? So we'll talk about semantics later. And then when you define the notion of equivalence, then you see why these two different formulas are actually meaning the same thing. Okay? Uh, dictionaries are books. How do we represent this in uh, formula? So here, uh, imagine that you have to use the quantification. We are talking about all dictionaries are books. Okay? All elements that belongs to dictionary also belongs to the book. So for all x, if x is a dictionary, then x is a book. We are going to write uh, this formula. Okay. Therefore, no dictionary is gaseous. Okay. So how do we say this? No dictionary is gaseous. It's actually similar to the first sentence. There is no X such that it is dictionary and gaseous. Now, therefore is something that I didn't write here, okay, which I'm going to denote as derivation. Okay. Okay. This is this remind you that what we did earlier with the train example. In the train example, we had the uh, set of premises, and then whether this entails the conclusion. Same here. We are given a set of statements above, and then whether this entails or derives this thing. Okay. In principle, all we did in the first half of the semester with proposition logic can be repeated here with um, more complicated structure. There is a natural deduction for first order logic. Uh, there is also the semantics of first order logic. And there is also soundness and completeness theorem for first order logic. Okay. All right. Uh, let's look at another example. So every child is younger than his mother. 
So we are going to denote uh, the uh, atomic fact using C of x, meaning that x is a child, and M of x, y means that x is y's, uh, y's mother. Okay. Okay, so this is actually the uh, rule that you can see. Okay. So for all x and for all y, if x is a child and y is, I'm sorry, yeah, y is x's mother, because you're actually uh, flipping it, so y is x's mother, then x is younger than y. Okay, so every child must be younger than his mother. Um, there's actually another thing uh, in uh, first order logic, which is instead of the predicate, you can use functions. And m of x is a function that is applied to uh, uh, the variable x. And m of x is a term, meaning that this represents an individual, not a true or false. So when you say m of x, this, is, this represents individual who is a mother of x. And if you use this function sometimes, the sentences in first order logic can be much shorter and probably more easier to understand. So you say that for all x, if x is a child, then x is younger than his mother. Okay? So this is because um, uh, m of x is a function. By definition, function means if you give x, that returns exactly one m of x. So assuming that everybody has a unique mother, which is not necessarily true all the time, but most of the time that should be true. So in that case, we can write it as a function. Um, on the other hand, brother of, or maybe sister of, is not a functional relation. So you cannot use uh, this kind of uh, representation. In that case, you have to use this. OK. Uh, all right, so let's actually try to solve this problem together. So we ha uh, here we have uh, symbols A, P, and Q. Uh, A is an object constant. Uh, P is a unary uh, predicate constant. Okay, and Q is uh, binary. Okay, so we say that uh, A, so we are going to give a meaning to these uh, formulas. A represents number 10, and P of X represents that X is a prime number, and Q of X, Y represents that X is less than Y. Okay? So, here is a sentence. Um, for all prime numbers are greater than X, how do we represent? So the sentence here is this English statement. For all y, if y is a prime number, then x is less than y. Okay? In other words, y is greater than uh, x. Okay? Are we together? Is this sentence true or false? All prime numbers are greater than x. True or false? So this is unknown because we don't know what is x, right? So the values of this formula belongs, uh, uh, is determined, by, uh, actually dependent on what x that we have, okay? So if x equals zero, is it true? All prime numbers are greater than x if x equals zero. Is it true or false? It's true, right? But if x equals 10, is it true or false? It's false. So what that means is uh, this sentence, we cannot simply assign the value, OK? So we, we don't know its truth value yet. What is the reason? The reason is we don't know what is x. So in defining the semantics of first order logic, this kind of sentence is bad because we cannot assign truth values, okay? 
So in a rough uh, set, we are going to actually define more formally later. But here, we have uh, this x that is not quantified. Okay, so the meaning of this uh, formula below, uh, de uh, it, uh, depends on x. This is a bad one. We are not going to assign the meaning to this kind of formula un until you know what is the value of x. Okay. All right. So we'll make this uh, notion more precise next time. But uh, for now, this should be enough to uh, tackle this problem. So let's actually play with this one. Anyone who has solution to this problem, you're welcome to come and write your solutions. Um, one constraint here is you cannot use any other symbols than what I give you here. Okay, what are the symbols that are allowed for you to use? You can use A, P, and Q, X, Y, or parentheses, and any propositional connectives and any quantifiers are fine. Okay? All right. That means you cannot use equality. I didn't introduce equality here. Okay? So the problem that you need to represent is there is a prime number that is less than 10, or x equals 0, or x equals 9. Okay? Note here that there is a prime number that is less than is true or false statement. It, it, we, can find, we, we know that whether this is true or false. But uh, this sentence, x equals 0, we don't know whether this is true or false until you fix the value of uh, uh, x. Okay? So meaning that you know, uh, in accordance with what we observed, when you write this sentence in uh, uh, first of the logic formulas, x must not be quantified. Same for the next one. But note here that you have symbols for the 10, which is a, but you don't have symbols for 0. You don't have symbols for 9. OK, how can we represent? Um, Let's actually do this problem together. Okay, so there is a prime number that is less than 10. Uh, and then in the meantime, if some of you can find the solutions to the rest of the problems, then we can talk about it. Okay. So how do we write the first one? There exists a prime number that is less than 10. This is actually not too hard. Okay. So there is. You can infer that you need an existential quantification. And although the English sentence didn't say about the variables, but you can think about this as informally, there is a number x such that x is prime and x is less than y. Okay, I'm turning the sentence, it's slightly longer, but could be easier to write in uh, formulas. Okay, because when I say there is a number x, this is there exists x, such that x is prime, p of x, and x is less than y, q of x comma y, but now y is actually 10, I should actually say 10 here. I cannot write 10 here because 10 is not a part of the symbol that I'm allowed to use, but I can write A. I'm done. There exists x such that x is a prime number that x is less than 10. So uh, uh, problem 1A was done. Okay, for B, anyone wants to try x equals 0? x equals 9, there are infinitely many prime numbers. Let me give you one minute to think about. Or if anyone of you have solutions, then just come to the board and write your solution. That will be your participation credit. Oh, by the way, uh, for the participation credit, um, I cannot actually add up to the total because when I do that, everybody else who doesn't have the participation credit will get the total get lowered for some weird reason. So I'm just keeping as a separate uh, column. The way that you calculate is you get one from the participation credit, just add up to the 1% to do your total uh, percentage. Okay, if you have three, then you add up to 3%. Okay, so 
So the currently, the, in the, on the canvas, the total is on, uh, not counting in any uh, uh, participation credit. So if you do have participation credit, uh, just add 1% or 2%, whatever the uh, number of uh, the participation that you made uh, successful. And also, uh, let me know uh, if there's any discrepancy in the record, because sometimes uh, TA may not have informed me correctly, or maybe there are some miscommunication. We try to avoid all these issues. But just in case, uh, if you find a discrepancy, do not wait uh, until then. Just uh, uh, talk to us earlier. OK? Anyone who doesn't have participation credit wants to write? Just listen for 30 seconds and nobody comes and it's yours. Okay, so anyone who needs participation credit wants to try? No? Well, actually, everybody needs it. <laughs> I do see one great uh, jump up there um, often. Um, I should have said that no, uh, anyone who doesn't have participation credit. Okay, so then uh, Riley was going first, so let's give him a chance. Uh, which one do you do? Two. Okay, so that means uh, B and C are open yet. Which one? Uh, two. two. <laughs> okay. So two is actually easier than the B and C. 